Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast. My name is Scott Miller, and I serve as your host and interviewer each week of what is now the world's fastest growing and still largest weekly leadership podcast. I'm also the author of a series of books from HarperCollins called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, 10 volumes in the 10 Decades series, where each year I publish a new volume focused on insights from guests we've had on this podcast. With their permission, I pick 30 people that I think offered a, a, an especially profound, transformative insight, and I write a short, easy, breezy chapter about them. And who knows, maybe today's guest might be uh, so considered to have me feature him in volumes four or five. I've also just released volume two in the Master Mentor series. Hope you'll pick them up. Kind of the new chicken soup for the leadership soul. You know, today is a great land. I have followed this gentleman's career for nearly 30 plus years. His name is Marcus Buckingham. He is the founder and he might say chief evangelist of the strengths movement. He is a, a researcher and scholar Got his start, you might say, at the Gallup organization. You know, of course, know him as the incomparable books. First, Break All the Rules, Now Discover Your Strength, How Full Is Your Bucket, his new book, Love and Work. You know him from his social media influence and platform, his passion around helping us understand and find what is our meaning and our passions in life. Marcus Buckingham, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. How the heck are you? I'm great, man. Nice to see you, Marcus. Marcus. Barkus is kind of like a combination of Marcus and Barkus. It's kind of like Angelina and Pitt and Brad Pitt. Yeah. Right? I'm going to call you Barkus. Very, Marcus very, Marcus. very like that. I like that. I coined the phrase. Give me some royalties on that. Marcus, thank you for joining us. I have followed your career for three plus decades. I first learned of you back in 1993. I was about a six month employee into my four year tenure at the Disney Development Company in Orlando, Florida. This was the real estate arm of the Walt Disney Company. We built hotels and cruise ships, and namely, the town of Celebration. And we had our annual town hall meeting where this very charismatic and handsome, well-educated, smart Brit got up on stage and talked about how we were going to discover our strengths and learn what our strengths were. I think maybe one of the books had just come out. You were an early scholar at Gallup under Don Clifton, and you had this mesmerizing impact on me as one of, you know, thousands of people in the audience. And I'll never forget that day when I thought, gosh, I kind of want to be him. I want to be like him. I knew I wouldn't get a PhD in statistics or whatever it is you have that I'll never get, but I very much fashioned my career after yours. And then fast forward a decade, the Disney company invites me to leave which is how they do it at Disney. And where does a single Catholic boy from Orlando move? Well, of course, to Provo, Utah, where all the Catholics were. No, there were no Catholics in Provo, Utah. And Stephen Covey hired me. And fast forward about three or four years later, I go to see you at the World Business Forum that hmm. year in Chicago, I think it was. And I've read every book and bought every book you've ever written for my team members. Marcus, it's an honor to have you here today. And we want to talk about your book, life and work, but would you take a few minutes and sort of reorient our millions of viewers and listeners to your trajectory professionally from your life with Gallup to your life now with ADP, what you're doing in terms of your books. Talk a bit about your journey, if you will. Sure, Scott. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for having me on. First of all, can you hear me all right? Is Perfectly. My Perfectly. Sound and vision good? Okay, great. Um, yeah, my, well, my dad was in HR. My grandfather was in HR. Um, my dad ended up the personal director of Allied Breweries, which had 7,000 pubs in the UK. And in 1982, 83, he was trying to find a way to find better pub managers because the way that pubs work is it's not the beer that makes the difference, it's the quality of the pub manager. And so he was looking around for ways to, to systematically uh, find better pub managers. And he bumped into a chap called Dr. Donald O. Clifton, who was the chairman of Gallup, and the grandfather really of positive psychology. Uh, he had a, a firm in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, dad brought him over to see whether or not they could figure out the strengths and the talents of pub managers. And I was just about to go up to university at the time and was fascinated by psychology, but most psychology was, was the study of pathology. So you study neurosis or psychosis or depression, which is, which is fine and worthy obviously of study. But uh, Don's approach was that excellence in anything isn't the opposite of failure. And, and you don't learn anything about excellence from studying failure. That doesn't mean that failure is not useful, but, but you don't learn about happy marriage from studying divorce. You don't learn about happiness from studying depression. 
his whole thing was let's study what's right with people and see what we can learn. So I was riveted by that and came over to Nebraska <laughs> of all places, which I didn't know anyone, um, I'd never been there, but all the way through my university years, I came out to Lincoln for three or four months in the summer. And then when I graduated, I, um, I decided that this would, I was just immediately ri riveted by the idea of how do you reliably measure things about humans that are very, very important, but that you can't count. So how do you measure strengths? How do you measure talents? How do you measure engagement? How do you reliably measure leading? How do you measure uh, resilience? How do you measure inclusion? D, E, and I. We can measure the D, we can measure the, we can count the D, and we can count the E. But what about inclusion? How do you, how do you measure stuff like that? So that's really what I spent all of my time at Gallup doing. I was there for 17 years. And we, we wrote uh, First Break All the Rules. We, we dove into the measurement of strengths and created, Don and I wrote Now Discover Your Strengths and created Strengths Finder. And was, it was a fantastic time. And then Don uh, passed away in 2003. And as sometimes happens with folks, you know, you've, you've joined a company, but your, your deep relationship and your loyalty, if you like, is to a, a manager or a leader and the team that you're on. And so when he passed away, um, I just decided that now might be a good time for me to try and rather than measuring things, why wouldn't I try to build a company that would help you build things that were important, but that you couldn't improve if you didn't really work on it. So measuring strengths is fine. How about building them? Measuring engagement. Well, that's fine. How about building engagement? So for the next 10 years, actually 15 years, I built my own company, starting off as a training and coaching and development company. But like Frank and, uh, Franklin Covey. And then I realized, Scott, that this is about 2012, 13. I realized that there were no tools for team leaders, um, that if you wanted to really get a great team built, you could give education all you want. You could give training and coaching to team leaders all you want. But if the tools that they were given to actually engage and activate the talent of their people were antithetical to the training you were giving them, then the tools trump the training. As Marshall McLuhan says, we, we make our tools and then our tools make us. And if you looked at a lot of the tools given to team leaders, they weren't strengths-based. They weren't individualized. In fact, they were focused on the core competencies that every single person needed to have. And then we would rate you against those and then show you where your gaps were and then tell you how to fix your gaps. So, so all of the HR tools in which many people lived um, were antithetical to everything that I was teaching so, and everything that the world's best managers actually do. So I built a, a technology company where we try to help team leaders simply have the three tools that every team leader needs to have, which is number one, an assessment on who the heck are my people? How are they wired? How do I get the best out of them? How does this one learn versus that one? Um, how, do I, um, how do I focus this one versus that one? So that's the first question. The second obviously is what are they working on this week? How can I help? So like a frequent check-in tool with coaching attached to it. And then lastly, how are my people feeling? What's, what are the mood of the troops? And so could I create a very, very simple engagement metric that the team leader would deploy and they get feedback on? So, so we built that and, and, uh, and obviously now fast forward a decade, everyone's trying to do that because we all know that pretty much so goes the team leader, so goes the company. So we gotta get tools in the hands of team leaders. Built that and then ADP came over and ADP is a payroll company and they didn't really have much of a human capital management offering. And so they looked at what we were building. Some of our biggest clients were really, really big companies like Deloitte, Accenture, Cisco. And they were like, well, why wouldn't we buy this company and take these tools and, and try to move from just being pure payroll into being a full service human capital management company? And I said, uh, well, for me, it was scale. It's like, okay, ADP has a little under a million customers, not, not people, like companies, a little under a million companies. So if you wanted to change the world, you've got to have some really big friends. Well, they were, they were big. And they also said, look, we have an institute. So if we buy your assets here, would you consider sort of continuing your trajectory, which you started at Gallup as a researcher? These days, we have a lot of, we have a, we have a lot of people with a lot of thoughts and a lot of people with really big social media followings. And we listen to a lot of these people. TikTok is, is very loud. So is Instagram. And so the question for many of us is, who are we listening to and why do we trust them? And I've always been 
My answer to that question has always been, well, let's look at the data. Let's look at reliable data about humans rather than just what do you think? Let's look at what the data show. So the idea that ADP with, with this huge global reach, a million companies, um, for, for a data nerd like me, Scott, a million companies gives you an opportunity to do what we do now. So the Institute, which is a non-commercial, this is, it's funded by ADP, but it's a non-commercial enterprise. It's just doing research for the greater good. And we do stratified random samples of the working populations of about 55, 56,000 people a year in the US and about 54,000 people globally in 27 countries around the world on issues that relate to engagement, to strengths, to stress, to is there really such a thing as quiet quitting? Is there really such a thing as the great resignation? Um, are people really discriminated more based upon race or LGBTQ plus status versus not? Like what's the, what's the data show? Because no one really cares what I think. Sorry, Scott, but no one really cares what you think. What people care about is what's real. And so I, I kind of love the idea of having an opportunity to, to do really rigorous research in the real world at massive scale and then be able to say somewhat definitively, well, look, right now, all we know for sure is X or Y or Z. And to not necessarily be prescriptive, like, well, here's what we should do, but to at least be a place where when people want to know what's, what's true, what's the truth, um, there's a place that one could go that's objective, unbiased. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. And I'm doing other things too. I'm doing a, a bunch of other stuff, which I'm sort of intrigued by. But, but in terms of my, uh, my research focus through the ADP Research Institute, that's, that's really a continuation, I see it, as, of Don Clifton's work as a, as a researcher, as a psychometrician. Marcus, you're inarguably the world's preeminent authority on strength-based leadership. And I think it's important to clarify that you say your, your strengths aren't necessarily what you're good at. I think a lot of us you know, think of our strengths as what we get praised for, what maybe what we are good at. But clarify the concept. How does someone understand what their strengths are? And are you still passionate about this concept of running with your strengths? Well, yeah, in fact, this latest book, Love and Work, takes it down to the DNA of that. When I first started at Gallup, our whole focus was measuring strengths, which no one had. Like Strength Finder was the first really archetypal way of creating a language to talk about human strengths. Um, and, and then I built Standout, which is an assessment that's, that's really for the manager to help them know about their people. So the Strength Finder is for the individual, Standout is for the manager. But this was still basically having someone outside of you tell you what your particular strengths are, which is not not useful, but it's certainly someone else telling you who you are. The next move really is to say, wait a minute, what is a strength? We tend to think that strengths are what you're good at, weaknesses are what you're bad at, and therefore that other people, your teachers, your parents, your manager, is the judge, or, or an assessment, is the judge of what your strengths are. But when you push on that even a little bit, you bump into a problem because every single one of us have some things that we're really good at that we hate. We have some things that for whatever reason, because we're driven or because we're smart or responsible, we're good at a lot of stuff, but the actual doing of the stuff uh, drains us, bores us, drags us down. If we never had to do it again, we'd be really happy, but we're good at it. Well, well, well what do you call that? Well, actually, if you push on it properly, you call that a weakness. A weakness is any activity that weakens you, even if you're good at it. A strength is any activity that strengthens you, if, even if you're not good at it yet. So what that does is almost immediately is it says to you, hey, 11 year old, you're the judge of your strengths, your teachers aren't, your parents aren't, your managers aren't, you are the best judge of the activities that strengthen you. Now, whether or not you can turn them into practice and the practice into skill development and the skill development into contribution, well, that varies. It's not always a perfect one-to-one -one link of appetite to performance. But there's certainly something hugely powerful for people. I mean, you've got three kids, Scott. It's, there's something very powerful in saying to a 10-year-old, you know what your strengths are better than anyone else does because you know the activities that strengthen you. Um, and then if you push one level into that, Scott, you go one more level down. And if you were to try to change the world, I mean, look, we have this huge epidemic of anxiety and depression and mental ill health in our adolescents and our young adults. Um, just everything in terms of suicidal thoughts, actual suicides, um, negative health episodes, depression, uh, drug usage and 
prescription in order to mitigate those things are, are on a J curve up. So we're, we're doing something that's deeply, deeply, deeply undermining our children, our adolescents and our students. And so my hope in writing Love and Work was to go, let's push through that definition of strength, that it's something that strengthens you. And let's actually tell you as a nine-year-old or as a 10-year-old, I mean, the book isn't written for nine-year-olds, but it's let's get you into the word love and say to you unequivocally that, that every single activity in your day is energetic. Every single activity and every day throws thousands of activities at you, a moment, a situation, a conversation, an email or whatever. A day is filled with these, I call them threads, these, these thousands of threads every day. Some of them are black, white, gray, green. They're sort of emotionally neutral. But some of these threads are red threads. These are activities that you love, little moments, very specific things that you love, not big, broad things like I like working with people, but really specific things like I like persuading certain kinds of people to do what they wouldn't intend to do otherwise, like really specific things. And, and we know biochemically, Scott, that, that by the time you're 19 years old, you have 100 trillion synaptic connections in your brain. We know that the uniqueness of you isn't a function of your race, <laughs> your gender, your age, your religion, your nationality, all the things that we tend to point to when we talk about our identity, which are important, but you share them with millions of other people. The uniqueness of you, and, and sometimes we point you know, to our biography as we grew up. Well, I was shaped by the fact that my dad did this or my mom did that. And some of those biographical details are important, but you share them. It's like Venus and Serena Williams have the same dad, but they play tennis completely differently. They finish points differently. George Clooney had a very famous aunt, Rosemary Clooney, but so did his sister. Same aunt. His sister's called Ada. You've never heard of Ada because Ada's an accountant specializing in payroll. So all Neil Armstrong had a brother, an elder brother, Dean Armstrong. He didn't walk on the moon because he was a bank manager. So the really interesting stuff about who the heck are you isn't a function of your race, gender, age, and it isn't a function of your biography. It's a function of why is Neil different from Dean Armstrong? Why is George different than Ada Clooney? Why is Venus different from Serena in terms of who they are? Why are you different than your brother or your sister or your closest cousins? You have 100 trillion synaptic connections in your brain. And those are completely unique, utterly unique from anyone else in the world. We know that you grow most you learn most, you develop, you develop the most, where you have the most pre-existing synaptic connections. We know that. That means you learn, your, your areas of opportunity for growth lie in those thickets of synaptic connections that are unique to you. We also know that when you're doing any activity that you love, when you get into the zone of doing any little activity that you love, your brain chemistry changes and you have elevated levels of neuro, uh, uh, norepinephrine or serotonin or anandamide, oxytocin. We know that. And what that does is it, it, it dysregulates your neocortex, opens your brain up to a, a mindset called broaden and build versus fight and flight, where you're open to new learning, new opportunities, new innovations. So we know two things now. We know, number one, that you are incredibly complicated as a human being and that the decoder that in a sense God has given you is love, that the activities that you love draw you into revealing to you the unique pattern of connections in your brain that make you different than your sister or your brother, loves your decoder. So if we can get you really early going, wait a minute, wait a minute, there are red threads every day. And every day your life is trying to kind of show you a whole bunch of threads. Is it this one? What about that one? Is it this one? Your life's trying to show you what you love so that you can make a greater contribution. Your three kids won't be taught any of this ever, which is a tragedy. And your kids, if you're not careful, will get put through a system which makes them more anxious and alienated from themselves. And then when they go into the world of work, we will do more of that to them. And we'll couch it in nice phrases like growth mindset, which is fine, Carol Dweck's work is great. But if you're not careful, what growth mindset means is you don't have anything in there you're empty. You, your unique pattern of synaptic connections is irrelevant. You can, you can rewire your brain. We know that's completely factually not true. So we know that love can decode your brain. We also know that you grow most in those areas that you love. So long answer to a short question, but yes, everything that we know about human growth and development says that you are utterly unique 
and that as you grow through your life, you grow most as you maximize your uniqueness and turn it into contribution. Possibly the most valuable 15 minutes in 250 episodes in four years. Marcus, you're um, a class act. With your permission, I want to pivot to your son, Jack. Uh, like several people, you've been a mentor of mine at arm's length for several decades. I've read every book you've ever written. I follow you on every social platform. I go to conferences where you are one of the speakers. And about 15 years ago, prior to me being married and now the father with my wife, Stephanie, of three young boys, I was single and you gave a speech once at the World Business Forum. And you said something that I have thought about for 15 years and it has haunted me in a positive way. You shared a story of your son, Jack. I think he might have been five or six years old, maybe even younger. This was 15 years ago, where you and he were once at a football game and you were sitting next to your son and all of a sudden, you were watching your son's emotional reaction to his team winning or losing. And it was in that moment that you came as a father to understand what your son's strengths were, likely what his career path may or may not be. And it also transformed the way that you would choose to parent him and put him in situations to find love and choose his work. Will you recreate that story for the millions of leaders and parents who are watching today in the hopes that maybe it has the same profound impact on them that it did on me nearly 20 years ago? Well, one of the first questions, like it's an interesting question as, as a parent and also as a leader, but one of the questions for you as a parent is when was the first time you stopped seeing your child? Was it the mommy and me class where you went in and, and, you, and you sweated out the fact that your kid wasn't in the 90th percentile of walking on or hopping on one foot? Um, was it the time that maybe a little later when they got their first grades and you started to worry about what their grades were at school and you looked at the grades and, and you stopped seeing the child? Or maybe it was when they were putting their, putting their college application together and you started, the, the, it was the GPA, it was the GPA, it was the GPA, it was the college application and you stopped seeing the child then. Or maybe it was when you dropped them off at college and, and you really just focused for them on, on, on whether or not they would succeed in the particular major that they had acquired so they could get the right qualifications to get, like when was the first time you stopped seeing your child? We, we throw so much at you as parents that try to get you to stop seeing your child. It's the most bizarre thing. If you step back a little bit, Scott, you'll see, I mean, you've got three kids. You'll see this, it's really hard to push that noise away and just see the child. One of the things I hoped for with love and work, there's a whole thing on, on parenting, not that I'm some blooming perfect parent, I'm so not, but, but systematically with stopping parents from seeing children and you can't love what you can't see. You can't love what you can't see. So with Jack, my son, the only reason why I like, you know, I bow down to Don Clifton because he inculcated in my thick head so early that every single human being is, is beautifully and immediately unique. The moment my son, when my son was born, this wasn't quite the story you wanted, but when my son was born, he was just about to be born, we lost the heartbeat. And then it came back. And then we lost the heartbeat. And then it came back. And, and we were rushed into the, into the delivery room because this isn't a good thing to lose heartbeats and get them back. And right when he was born, the doctor, she said to me, come look at this. And I'm like, what? And, and he, the doctor says, I've never seen this. And my son was born holding his umbilical cord like this. He was squeezing it, fainting, waking up, squeezing it, fainting, waking up, <laughs> squeezing it. And that's kind of how Jack goes through life, like intense and then chill, and then intense and chill. When a child is born, if you've had a kid or more than one kid, like you get a sense that they have what the, what the Norse, the ancient Norse called your weird. Not, not that you're weird like an adjective, but like a noun. You have a weird, W-Y-R-D, which is like a spirit or a diamond or something inside of you that's there when you're born. And with, with Don Clifton's whole thing, it was always that your, your child, we now know it's a function not of spirituality necessarily. I don't know what everyone's spiritual beliefs are, but we know it's a function of the, the synaptic connections in your brain that are completely and utterly unique from the get-go. And so with Jack, with that story, I was, we were watching a, watching a football game, Arizona Sun Devils football game that I'd taken him to because for whatever reason, he was really into the Sun Devils. We didn't live in Arizona. And, his, and the team started to lose. 
and he couldn't stay in the stadium, just couldn't stay in the, couldn't physiologically deal with it, didn't know what to do with the pain and anxiety. He was, he was completely, it's almost like his, his weird was too big for his body. He couldn't, didn't know what to do with it. And we, and we went, we watched the rest of the, we watched the rest of the game from TV, which they came back and won, by the way, <laughs> from the hotel room across from the stadium. And then in the, in the plane on the way back, uh, I was leaning forward to close the blind uh, on, on what I thought was our seat. And as I'm doing it, uh, Jack goes, don't, don't do that, that's his, that's his. And you, you watch little symbols like that where my kid doesn't know what to do with his competitiveness or when he's thinking that the other person in the front seat might think that we're closing the, his blind, like the kid's five. Okay, I'm not saying that my kid can't learn and grow and develop. Of course he can, has done. But you can see signs right away that there are certain, probably there are certain patterns there of him vis-a-vis -vis competition, vis-a-vis -vis the, the spirit and the joy or the thrill or the passion of, the com of competition for him doesn't, it doesn't compute right for him. I'm not saying there aren't every kid, maybe even the competitive ones, you know, they, they're, they're not good losers. All right, that's fine. But with Jack, it wasn't a positive thing for him. It was a negative thing. And yet instinctively on the plane on the way back, he's instinctively paying attention to the other person's feelings as it relates to the blind in their seat. Now, if you want to know your kid, you watch to see how they pay attention. What do they pay attention to? What do they instinctively pay attention to in a world where they can pay attention to anything? Same with leaders. If you're a really good leader, what you begin with, of course, is curiosity. You leave space because space leads to choice and choice leads to discovery. So you're looking at people making choices and you're seeing where they pay attention to things and you're looking for patterns of attention. Well, in Jack, there are patterns of attention that are super different than his sister, who's two years younger and nothing to do with gender, just to do with clash of the chromosomes. So that, that, that's a lesson all of us as parents and teachers can learn, which is that person that you're leading or that person that you're parenting is not an empty vessel that you can, learning for that person is not information transfer and confirmation through testing. That is not true. As a, as a leader or as a parent, you, you are dealing with, when you're trying to get the best out of another human, you are dealing with a human that's got an awful lot of incredible filigreed, massive complexity. There are more synaptic connections in the people on your team as a leader. In each person, there are more synaptic connections in their brain than there are stars and planets in 5,000 Milky Ways. That is not hyperbole, Scott. That is an actual measure of how much unbelievable complexity is in the minds and the brains of the people that you lead or the people that you parent. And so the, the only challenge you can, like you can never decode that. What you should help them do is have a language for decoding it. And the language of love, frankly, is the best language. The moment you're born, you're searching for love. It's the language that every one of us can speak. And then as a, as a leader or as a parent, what you're trying to do is leave enough space so that the person can make choices and then you can see, observe the patterns of choices and attention that they have, because those choices will start to reveal what's in there. That's, that's my Jack, <laughs> that's my Jack story. Marcus, you have served as my Jiminy Cricket for decades. Uh, last year, my middle son, who is 10, his name is Smith, he is my physical twin. He loves the Utah Jazz. We live about five blocks from where they play downtown Salt Lake City. This year they traded all their good members so he doesn't care about them anymore. But last year, when they would lose, my middle son, Smith, who does not have a, 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 an anger management problem or a temper at all, he's quite aloof emotionally, he would, he would wail and he would scream and he would slam doors and he would find himself curled in the upstairs bathroom because he was so emotionally intense about his team losing. He's grown out of that now. A, he just doesn't care because they traded Donovan Mitchell. My point is I would, I would be thinking of uh, placating him or trying to talk sense into him. And when that wouldn't work, I would get angry. And you were like in, on my shoulder as Marcus Buckingham, my Jimmy Cricket, saying, no, there's something for me to learn about how he's dealing with this. I want to thank you for a parenting gift that you've given me to be a better parent to all three of my sons. But I want to shift because you've already answered many of my questions but this, I think, is profound. I hope everyone is still watching and listening because back in November of 2019, you gave what you called the speech you never intended to give. You were at a conference in 
you'd had a particularly um, traumatic experience within your big broader family with what is yeah. your former wife and your children. And uh, there's a complex part of this story because you and I share something in common. We are both stutterers. I've been a lifelong stutterer in my, in my professional and personal career. I've had braces four times, headgear, Invisalign, speech therapy, speech pathology. It's been a debilitating issue for me. We share some of that. And I'd like you to take the remaining 10 minutes and I'd like you to piece together your upbringing as a stutterer and the role that your mother played once in a speech you were called to give, and then connect that, if you will, to the speech you gave and how maybe John Maxwell shares in that and the traumatic experience your family was involved in and what we all can learn from this. Well, gosh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, um, you know, I'm a lifelong romantic, so I, for me, the idea of, of lifelong love is a, be is a beautiful thing. But after 19 or so years of marriage, I'd realized that, that I wasn't, somehow there was something really different about the way in which myself and my ex did life, the way that we made choices, and particularly in the way that we were thinking about our own, our own kids. And I couldn't really put my finger on it, but it was, it was, leaving us, it was leading us more and more uh, astray from one another. And so we, um, and I really, you know, it was really hard, but we, we ended our marriage and driven by me and I wasn't going to something else or someone else. I was just, this isn't right for me. And so we had a, a divorce, which is always really, really hard and particularly hard on the, on the, on the kids. But fast forward uh, two and a half years or so after that. And it turns out that um, my uh, ex had been one of those people who had, paid someone to take the ACT for my son. Uh, he'd already gotten into the school that he needed to get into. He'd already taken ACT under Proctor and he was in a great school. And for whatever reason, um, my ex had decided that she was gonna pay somebody $50,000 to have somebody else take the ACT for him in order to get a slightly better school. Um, and to discover that, I won't bore you, I mean, I write about it in the book, so it's out there, but but it's, you know, it's devastating uh, for all sorts of reasons, which I we could have another conversation about. But what you realize is that the sort of the most generous explanation for why anybody involved in that scandal did what they did was because they were frightened for their kid. That's the most generous explanation. You might, the least generous might be that they're entitled or that they have no, no sense of ethics. But, but the most generous explanation is that you're frightened for your kid. And, and parents do that a lot. We're, 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 we're frightened for our kids. And, and like you, um, you know, in, in the days after this happened, I was so volcanically angry, I can't even tell you. And uh, you can imagine just how much you're trying to process and protect, but you can't really, anyway, I was, a, uh, I was a mess in the days afterwards. And the only thing I kept coming back to is my mom and dad, who were not perfect by any means, but they had certain ways of approaching parenting that are really useful for all of us to think about as leaders and as parents. And the, and the main thing that they did so beautifully was they made space, they left space, they were space makers. They were space makers, which as I was just saying earlier, allowed us kids to make choices. And then they would allow us to learn from those choices and also to allow them to see us in the choosing. I had, like you, first 12 years of my life, I had a stutter, I mean, a really, really, really bad one. And like you, I, well, I don't know like you, but all the way through the first 12 years of my life, all I was thinking about was that I can't, get anything that's up here out. I can't, and it's not a terrible trauma. I mean, people have worse traumas. I'm a white male in a first world country, so I have a ton of privilege, but it was, it was the greatest impediment and trauma of my early life. And, and as I studied it and studied it and studied it, I got worse and worse and worse and worse. I read every book. I did exactly what you did. I tried to, and it's funny with problems, isn't it, Scott? The more you look at them, in a sense, you change follows the focus of your attention. And if you're not careful, you become your stutter. Your stutter is your life. The problem that you're trying to fix becomes the, the defining integrating point of your life. And it certainly was for me. So it was getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then one day I was asked, not asked, <laughs> I was at a pretty boarding school and they were like, you will, I saw it on the notice board, you will go speak to the, to the school in chapel. They picked five people to speak and they picked me. And I was like, that's an, like sadism because I can't speak to my class. I can't speak to my mom, let alone to the whole school. And the night before in the chapel, the chapel's empty. I'm with the headmaster. I'm trying to practice there. I'm trying to, I don't know, figure it out. And it was terrible. No one in there, empty chapel. 
uh, and it was f- sort of 15, 20 minutes of awfulness as I tried to d- speak this two or three minute piece and I just, everything was elongated and oh, it was horrible. I wanted that, that night, I wanted my mom and dad to pick up the phone, call the, pe- the headmaster, make the space smaller, say, do not make my son do that. Do not make my son do that. I, I, there's nothing I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say it, but I wanted them to pick up the phone and go, don't make my son do this. Um, what I called in the book, like Pac-Man parenting, uh, not necessarily in a pejorative way, but there's an awful lot of parents that are like Pac-Man parents where you, the, it's the parent with the joystick and the little thing is moving up the different levels of life, but it's the parent moving the joystick. Well, I wanted one of those that day. I wanted my parents to yank the joystick, pick the phone and stop the thing the next day. And they didn't. Instead, they just let it happen. And I went up the next day and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking my life's over. My life at school is over. This is, the, my class knows I can't speak, but now the whole school will know that I can't speak. And my nickname was Buckingham at school. It was just like, it's like, oh my God, now the whole school is gonna, ugh. Anyway, my palms are sweating even, you know, talking about it now. And I get up and I walk up to the lectern and I turn to face the people in the chapel and I see a sight that I've never seen before. I see like 400 faces that are looking at me and I, I've never seen it before because I've never been asked to do it before because I can't speak. And yet for whatever reason, Scott, the stimuli of these faces trips something in my, there's some sort of synapses pattern that fires. It feels warm around my head. And, and I have fluency. The, the sight of all these faces trips something in my brain and I get fluency and I say the whole piece without a stammer. There was one little stutter on the word criticism, but whatever, it was a normal thing. And so I felt like a normal kid. I walked back and I was like, what just happened? And I wasn't brave. I didn't face up to my fears. I didn't push them away. I didn't, I, I did, all I did was I paid attention. I paid attention to the fact that that I mean, today I would call that a red thread. Me speaking in front of a lot of people is a red thread of mine. Time speeds up, steps fall away. I have fluidity, what, what Mike Chekshamahai called flow. I have that, what Sir Ken Robinson called being your element. Okay, that, that stimuli for me is a red thread. And the only smart thing I did, the only smart thing I did was I then took that red thread and I wove it into situations where I was struggling which sometimes is what love can do for all of us. It can help us solve our problems. So I said, well, why, if I can't speak in front of one person, but I can speak in front of 400, why don't I just pretend moving forward that whenever I'm talking to one person, I'm talking to 400 people. I'll just pretend I'll take, I'll weave that thread into this other situation that's really hurting me. And I know this is gonna sound super glib, but my stammer went away in a week. And I am not suggesting, Scott, and I'd love to hear another time, maybe like, how did you deal with yours in it? Because everyone's different. Every, not every person's different, obviously, but every stutterer is different. So that, I'm not suggesting my red thread to solve stuttering is everyone's, but it was mine. And so what I realized as a parent, you know, you've got your three kids, leaders have their people that are following them or working on their teams, is if my parents had been Pac-Man parents and yanked the joystick so that I didn't have to do that thing, then I would never have seen what I saw that day. And I would never have learned what I learned about me in life. And I would never therefore have been able to take that red thread and weave it into all other situations of my life. Now, my parents didn't know that that's what would happen in that space, but they made the space and they let me bounce around. They they put what I called in the book, a bubble of love around it. And there was a bubble of love around it. Picked me up, bounced me back up. I was like a little weeble. So there was love everywhere, but there was a lot of space in there. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Experience the space and see what you learn. Okay, that's genius, actually, for all of us as parents and leaders. We live in a world of education that doesn't allow that. We live in a world of, of, of human resources systems that don't um, institutionalize that where we take away choice, we take away space. 65% of people going to work today, Scott, have surveillance software on their computers to make sure that they're actually, you know, on the computer for the requisite amount of time. Like we don't, most of us don't do well with space. I mean, most, most companies don't feel comfortable with space. Individuals do incredibly well with space. So th- that's kind of the takeaway that I had from all of this. And as John said to me that day, I mean, I, I still have some work to do because as John Maxwell said at the time, it's like, 
you have to forgive because forgiveness isn't for the other person. The forgiveness is for yourself. And I have to work through how I forgive someone who is, you know, the parent of my kids who did something that hurt them. And that's, that's a big journey that I'll probably be working with my entire life. But that in a nutshell is what I tried to talk about in a speech that I never wanted to give or never intended to. Marcus, not only are you a masterful storyteller, but your vulnerability, I think, is so ennobling and empowering to everyone who is listening. I, I feel like the big takeaway there from a professional concept, the, the work part of love and work, is that like parents, as leaders, we need to recognize sometimes we do choose to interrupt and not create the space, rush in and save the day, or say, well, I, was, I, I would do it this way, so just watch me. And when we actually do that, we we imprint on our team members our belief in them, and we impact their self-esteem and self-confidence, remind everyone that our leaders of people, formal or informal, remind us again of the importance of creating that space for people to choose and find their own red thread. Well, look, I mean, one of the, one of the things I was trying to say in, in this book, and that book, Love and Work, is, I mean, it's a, you know, my whole background is data, but this is a really personal book. Yes. It's, it, it's a product of the pandemic in a sense. It's like, listen, we're only here for a short time. What the heck can I do that's, be, that's useful, like really meaningfully useful? So I wrote this book in a, in a much more personal and vulnerable way because we're all humans and what the heck. And if you think about what we're trying to do here, we're trying to say to each individual parent, each individual child, each individual leader, each individual team member, we're trying to say to them, look, there is no one in the world like you. There are not, sorry, there are not five love languages. There aren't. There are eight billion, one for each person alive today. What's yours? And when you start thinking about it at nine years old, we can help you begin to have a much more healthy relationship to your own life. Your life is not something to get through. Every day is not a to-do list to get through, to keep at bay. Every day, in a, I mean, it is. We have to do stuff. We have to contribute, obviously. But every day, your life is trying to put on a show for you. Every day your life is trying to show you a lot of different threads every day and sort of going, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? So that your days are nourishing. And so us as leaders, I'm sorry, this is one of the perils of feedback, one of the fallacies of feedback. If, if, feedback, if by feedback as leaders, we just mean attention, that I'm paying attention to how you do your work and I'm curious about it, then feedback's great. If, if feedback is just, this is my reaction to what you just did. This is my reaction to what you just said. Then that's brilliant. We should totally do that. If feedback becomes prescriptive, which it often is, as in, well, you should do more of this. Well, can you sit down? I'm gonna give you some feedback and I'm gonna tell you who you are. I'm gonna tell you what did right and wrong and I'm gonna tell you what you should do to do it differently and better. If feedback is that, then it's doomed. Most feedback is that, by the way. Most feedback that we institutionalize turns into, if you are well-intended as a leader, then you should be able to give feedback that's really tough. And by the way, flip that around, you should learn, team member, how to receive feedback. You should. Okay, no, you shouldn't. All of that is rubbish, psychologically rubbish. Learning, we know all learning is insight. All learning comes from the inside out. It's not any leader telling another person how to be a better version, how to do this better. The only place where that applies, Scott, is in the minimum performance requirements, where you have a nurse where you say, here are the six steps to giving a safe injection. Okay, that's minimum. You don't make up the other steps. There are these six. Or for a guest check-in clerk at a hotel, here are the six steps to check in a guest. Okay, that's minimum performance requirement. We can legislate that in advance. But when it comes to anything excellent, anything excellent, whether it's a nurse soothing a patient or whether it's a guest service person welcoming someone in, all of that comes from the unique uh, loves, loathes, and strengths and manifestations of that unique human. So us as leaders, we cannot tell someone how to be better. I mean, let's just stop there. You can't tell anyone how to be better. You can relay facts and you can relay preset steps. That's it. Everything else you have to do as a leader is step back, let the person choose, make decisions, make choices, and then you pay attention to those choices. And then what you're trying to do is maximize the unique loves that lead to strengths, that lead to performance, and then mitigate or minimize the other stuff. You can't do any of that if you're too busy giving feedback, which basically turns into, you would be much better at your job if only you were more like me.
okay, stop that. It's arrogant. Almost all feedback is arrogance. It's also a complete misunderstanding of how human beings grow. Stop it. S react. Share your reaction. You know what your reaction is as a leader. Share that. That's what you own. You know how you felt when you read that email. You felt confused. Or you know how you felt when you listened to that presentation. You felt bored. Like share, You can share that. But then any improvement from the other person is going to come from within them. So what you got to try to do is kind of pay attention to where they've shown something that was really cool, something where they were in flow, something where they were at their best. You got to pay attention to that. And then your real genius as a, as a leader is going, hey, I know you're so inside your own loves and then strengths that you can't even see them anymore. You're so inside the fabric, you can't even see the threads. But I'll tell you what, when you are hitting that part of the presentation, I promise you every single person lent in. We all lent in. Well, I know I did. If you could do a whole presentation the way you did that bit, oh my gosh. Okay, that's genius leadership. That's genius coaching, which is why I say in the book, the most obvious practical thing that the best leaders do is they're doing some sort of little check-in like that every week, 15 minutes every week with each person individually. What did you get a kick out of last week? What did you love last week? And then this next week, what are you up to? How can I help? It's like a constant 52 week love work, love work. I believe we've overcomplicated leadership, Scott. We've made it very complicated with all these skills that every leader shares. They don't. The best leaders in the world, we've measured it. They do not share all the same skills. They don't. What they do share is one thing. They share followers. And yet the way in which they get people to follow varies by person yeah. by person. Yeah. Well, how are you gonna to get to know the person? You gotta to talk to them frequently. Last week, this week, last week, this week. If you do that 15 minutes, every single person on your team, you'll start seeing stuff and you'll be able uniquely with this person versus that one versus this one versus that one to get the best out of each person on your team. That's leadership. This has been riveting. Marcus Buckingham, thank you for joining us. Your newest book out is called Love and Work. To your point, it's an especially vulnerable book, different than your other very science data research books. Uh, our time is up. Please tell us what's next for you. Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I'm sort of, um, I'm, the visual image in my head at the moment is that we've got, we're standing by the side of a river and we've got all these uh, sort of adolescents and students and young adults in their 20s um, floating by in the river, drowning. And we, in our different ways, jump in and drag them out. We jump in and we drag them out. We've been doing it for a long time now, whether it's through um, some support that we try to give people that are really uh, at a loss or whether it's the drugs that we prescribe to them, the, the, the Adderall, the Xanax, the Zoloft, the Wellbutrin, whatever it is we give them to help them float. And so my feeling right now is, well, why wouldn't we just walk upstream and stop pushing the kids in? Let's walk upstream. If your, your kids are about to come into this very age, Scott, 14 through 21, imagine all the transitions that happen, 14 to 21, all of those different transitions that your kids are going to go through. Yes, at the very end of, of, of mental extremists, we might give them psychiatry and we might prescribe some drugs. But there's an awful lot in the continuum of just how do we help kids 14 to 21 use the activities of their regular day at life and in school and wherever to give them agency, to help them know who they are, to help them channel who they are into contribution, which might mean learning, which might mean studying, it might mean on the team, it might mean trying to begin to figure out what you love to do and how you can turn it into work. Let's start, let's do 10 years of that. As I said, right at the beginning of the book, my daughter came up to me in the middle of the pandemic and said, what, what's the difference between a rhombus and a parallelogram? And I remember going, I don't know. And then thinking, wow, Somebody has decided that 10 years of geometry for my daughter is a really good thing. And, and 10 years of geometry may be a really good thing, but all the stuff that's going to wake her up when she's 29, who am I? How do I make a contribution? How do I investigate myself without being self-involved? How do I share who I am without bragging? How am I get curious about new team members, some of whom might work remotely and I never meet, without being intrusive? How, how do I do any of that? Okay, we give her nothing on that, like zero. Maybe they take Strength Finder and it's kind of fun, or they take Enneagram and it's a bit of a fun thing and they put it in a drawer. But all the really rigorous stuff that you could do 14 through 21 to help a person 
own who they are, understand how life is trying to educate them about who they are and then how they might turn that into contribution, we give them zero. Sorry, but your three kids will get zero on this. Well, I feel like right now I can't die and not at least try to give people a rigorous curriculum, if you like, or maybe it's a rigorous set of ongoing love and work champions who when you bump into a 15 year old who's like, I'm lost, you can go, hey, don't worry. There's a whole resource set over here to help you figure out, I'm your dad and your mom, we can't, you don't listen to us anymore. <laughs> and your teachers, you may mistrust a wee bit, but I'll tell you what, you've got wisdom inside you. You know better than anyone else is what you love and therefore what strengthens you and therefore what your contribution could be. Let's help you have the next five years. Let's help you have a rigorous way to do that in your own life. Gosh, if I could wave a magic wand, Scott, and have that already done, I would do that tomorrow. Marcus, uh, thank you. Uh, every encounter I have with you has made me a better leader, better friend, better parent, better spouse, whether it was you know, nearly 30 years ago at the Disney Development Company, seeing you on stage, reading your books, taking Strengths Finder, reading Love and Work. You are a class act, and if you're ever having a down day, I want you to remember the countless millions of people that have read your work or will read your work or will listen to this podcast that you have given them a little tweak on perspective on how to love better and how not to confuse their strengths with perhaps just what they're good at. Thank you for your generosity today. Well, my pleasure, Scott. Thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.